Hello, Vinay. Hi, Hi, sir. sir. How, are Hi, you? how are you? All right. Yeah, I'm good, sir. Good. Uh, yeah, so this is the new time. I don't know who else is going to make it, but we can wait a couple minutes for everyone to show up. Yes, yes sir, sure. sure. And, and also, also, thank you for uh, this thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. I, uh, I hope, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we had a time change here, and uh, oh, yeah. last spring I realized that not everyone in the world is on the same time change. So we had we've had problems with like every time change. Uh, it, it, we have a problem. Hey, how is it? Hi. Hello. How are you? Okay. Good. I got a request. Okay. <laughs> Any chance of uh, if it be compatible with the others of moving these to Monday instead of Wednesday? What time on Monday? Same time. Same time. Yeah. Uh, you mean the time that we're at right now? Yeah. Um, yeah, I could, I could move it. I think it'll be all right. I could check with other people, but okay. I just that would give me one, only one frantic morning per week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, check with the others. See if they're if it's compatible with their schedules. All right. Yeah, I know you were doing all your meetings on one day, but <laughs> yeah. Like, well. <laughs> See, I went back to sleep at 5.30. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not that I'm not an early riser, but it's I work in the middle of the night. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like working at night, too. It's like no one can yeah. bother you, you know. Except me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Jesse, how are you? You said that you would not be able to talk today. But you can listen in. That's fine. And Ojwal's here. How are you doing? Fine, sir. Hello. Good. Thank you. Uh, so we had a request that we move the meeting time to Mondays uh, at the same time. We moved it up at one hour for Vinay because his meals are uh, his meal like his meal plan doesn't allow him to meet at the an hour earlier. So, but now I'm asking if people would be okay if we move the meeting to Mondays at the same time. So it would be just a change in day. Yes, sir. That would be fine with me. Okay. Ujwal thinks it's okay. Jesse, do you think you could make it on Mondays or? Okay, that that's good. I think it'll. I'll try to do it from Mondays from now on. Uh, we're going to continue for a couple more weeks in the fall here, and then we'll see what happens in the spring. Um, so uh, we're kind of on an academic schedule <laughs> for this these meetings, but that's okay. Well, so uh, first of all, I should ask, anyone have any um, questions or things they want to bring up? Any news? Uh, I'm working on the... Uh Bacillaria paper. <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> okay, I started it on. All right, that's good. Uh, I saw Ujwal had a comment or two in there as well. And um, so I'm going to try to wrap that up soon. Or, you know, I got the things from Thomas. Thomas wanted to add some things in there, and we put them in. So we're going to go over it one more time, and uh, then we'll try to submit it pretty soon. Um, well, I... Uh, I actually going through your own notes, so when we're all happy with it, I'll do that and submit it. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I could use uh, uh, a list of about five people who are in their contact information uh, to suggest for reviewers. All right. Okay. All right. Especially because none of the crowd I know are familiar with machine learning. So. Okay. Yeah, I, okay. can, I can see what I can find. And Ujwal and, and Vinay, if you have uh, suggestions on that as well, um, if you see anyone you might in the literature you might think would be able to review it, just send me their contact info, and I'll I'll see if yeah. you know I'll think about it. <laughs> yeah, you look over the list of people cited. That's one way to try yeah. to figure out what to suggest. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, so Ujwal had an update, and Vinay has an update, I think. 
Uh, so Vinay's update is, I will be mentoring students for CGI this, GCI this year for TensorFlow. That's pretty good. So GCI is what? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, GCI is uh, nothing but like, it's a, it's a program which is similar to uh, GSOC, uh, but it's for students from age 13 to 18, uh, below 18 years. Okay. So uh, uh, I saw this application for the mentoring, and I thought I would apply, and I luckily I, I think I got in. So uh, I'll be having yeah. Are these students who have no computing background or what? Yeah, it can be both. Like uh, uh, these tasks are not only programming based; uh, they can be on design based or documentation based or any other kind of so. This program is specifically uh, dedicated to get students started into like open source. So there are all kinds of tasks for that. Uh, it can be technical and non-technical as well. So okay. uh, any kind of students can. Okay, great. Is it international? I guess, sir. It is international. In other words, I, I, I have two teenagers uh, in mind here in Canada. Uh, if they were interested, could they participate? Oh, yes, sir, of course, they can. Like, they need to choose an organization and then they need to... Uh, it's pretty much the same process for what we do for GSOC. Uh, first, they'll choose an organization which they're interested in and then they'll contact mentors and then uh, our organization administrators and then they'll, they'll have to get themselves uh, tasks assigned to themselves and then they need to complete that. So, okay. by the end of the program, is there a web page yeah, that describes the process of applying? Uh, one second, sir. I'll put the link for that. Okay. Great. So you said you were going to be a mentor. Is that, uh, is that kind of why like Google Summer of Code, or is it a little bit different than that? Yeah, it's pretty much like uh, how uh, uh, like how this GSOC works, but it's uh, it's a bit of less work than a GSOC uh, uh, mentorship because I'll be having so many mentors as well, uh, and under me there'll be a few tasks. Only regarding those tasks, people can contact me or or anything else. Like uh, I can help with other tasks as well. But it usually takes like less effort than entering a GSOC student, and also some a bit less time. Okay, well that sounds pretty good, and I think that's a good opportunity for you. Uh, you know, it's always good to have like, you know, to learn how to teach people things. That's always a good skill because you can, uh, you know, impart knowledge to people who otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to to get exposure. I mean, you can read things on the internet, but it's always better to have someone you know, help you along with things and, and, you know, give you advice. And so I think that's good. Uh, so uh, keep us posted on that. Um, that sounds interesting. Okay, great. I got the website. It's great. Yeah, yes, that's sure. Show. Okay, I'll distribute it to a few teenagers I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ojewal, did you have any, uh, you had said you had an update or some news? Uh, I don't have a uh, new update, but uh, last week, uh, my paper which I submitted on AAA conference uh, got rejection okay. due to like, it, like uh, we have submitted for its rebuttal, but I don't think it is in the way, so that's all about last week. Okay. Sounds pretty good. Um... And then uh, Jesse is going to the Envision conference uh, this weekend. You looking forward to that? Okay. Uh, Jesse said he's basically he's busy with grad school applications, and uh, he's fleshing out some of his own projects. He wants to present a machine learning paper. He sent me a copy of the paper he wants to review, probably in December. So we'll we'll talk about that offline a bit more. And then he's going to this conference called Princeton Envision 
which is a conference about technology, society, ethics, and looking at the future. So he probably can give us an update on that too once once it happens and everything. Um, so that's good. Well, uh, thanks for the updates. Um, so if there's nothing else that anyone wanted to talk about, we can go into the presentation I prepared here in reinforcement learning. So I uh, was thinking, like last week I did a presentation on game theory, and I think Jesse was here for it, uh, and I recorded it, and it's on the YouTube channel. So it's uh, it kind of leads into this because they talk, we talk about like games and competition and how that's being used in machine learning. It's actually a very interesting area, especially when you get down to like how they're using game theory to basically as a as sort of a uh, in lieu of a, a optimization function. So a lot of algorithms use loss functions, and so they're using game theory as sort of a stand-in for that. And the reason they do that is because you have a lot of non-convex spaces, meaning that they're not normally distributed. They're not smooth curves that you can hill climb or you can optimize easily. So you have a lot of problems where you have a very, what they call non-convex space, which is very irregular and something that's not easy to um, optimize. And so they play games between agents and they look for uh, what they call Nash equilibria, and it's it, that's actually very hard to do in mathematical terms. See, so, yeah, it's sort of like a rough landscape. It's it's as analogous to that. Um, so they're using Nash equilibria to find like these points that are sort of you know uh, solutions that will correspond with minimum loss. Uh, but the thing is, is that it's very hard to even do that mathematical analysis. So you know we're we're talking about something that you know, isn't really mathematically tractable a lot of the time. So, you know, people are applying these models just to get a good, uh, you know, handle on the problem. So, but today I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning, which is not exactly that, but it, it's related to that. So let's uh, present my screen. So this is reinforcement learning, and along the way we're going to talk about, we're going to kind of drift into biology and, and psychobiology. So if you see references to that, it's related. <laughs> uh, so this is what I mean. Uh, this is basically reinforcement learning is learning a process with a reward. And we most uh, associate this type of thing with animal behavior, but human behavior follows this as well. Uh, it's been demonstrated in animals like dogs and in, in rodents, where you have two kinds of conditioning. You have classical conditioning, uh, where you associate an involuntary response and a stimulus. So there's an idea of, you know, pairing these two stimuli and then taking one away, and you're motivated by the stimulus that's been paired. So, for example, if uh, th this is the example of the uh, Pavlov's dog, where you blow a whistle and present food to the dog. And the dog sees the food and hears the whistle and associates the two. So the dog starts to salivate at the food, but also at the whistle. Then you, after you train the dog on that for a while, that paired stimulus, you take the food away, and then you just blow the whistle. And in that case, the dog will still salivate, expecting the food reward as well. So you can assume the, the organism associates the two stimuli but even when you take one away, it still uh, maintains that association. Uh, operant conditioning, which is related, is associating some voluntary behavior and a consequence. So in this case, you have a rat that pushes a lever, and it this thing here, this machine dispenses food. Um, the rat will then learn that if you press the lever, food comes out. Now, if food doesn't come out and they press the lever, they'll still associate it with food. So the rat might go up to a machine that's empty and press the lever and expecting a food reward. 
And even if food doesn't come out, they'll still press the lever because it's, you know, they're associating those two things. Uh, this happens over, so this is a time dependent process. Uh, this is a diagram of what they call trials. So this is when they do this training. It's an experimental uh, context where they present these things in successive trials. So you present these two stimuli in, in one trial, two trials, three trials, in this case, up to 20 trials. So on the first trial, we have uh, we have a bell, and then we have food and salivation. And then uh, the 20th trial, salivation is going from an unconditioned response to a conditioned response. So you're actually conditioning salivation on the ringing of this bell rather than the presentation of food. And so this has a long history in psychology. This goes back to the 1890s with Pavlov. And he did these experiments with dogs where he associated the ringing of a bell with the presentation of food. And he was able to condition the dog's brain on these items. Uh, and there was Thorndike who came up with the law of effect. And uh, you can read more on this is just kind of to give you an idea of the history of this in psychology. Uh, and there's some famous experiments in here. The next person to really do some uh, groundbreaking work in this area was Skinner. And you probably heard of B.F. Skinner. He was the one who demonstrated operant conditioning. So this is pressing the lever and getting food. And then uh, Albert Bandura, who is more recent, who came up with something called social learning theory, which is based on uh, you know, reinforcement learning, but also in a social context. So this has a long history in psychology. And this person, Richard Sutton, is actually known for bringing this into like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, Richard Sutton actually has a background in psychology. So he came to computer science and he wrote a dissertation called Temporal Credit Assignment and Reinforcement Learning. And this is back in 1984. And uh, Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartow, uh, who was his doctoral advisor, have written this textbook called Reinforcement Learning. And so this is sort of the, the landmark book of the field. So this is actually available online for free through this link here. Um, this is like a, uh, a ver a, like a rough draft of the book, but it's free. And you can check it out online. Um, they've been writing this book. They think the first edition was in 1998. This edition that you can download is from this year. So they're updating it constantly with new examples. Uh, so Wikipedia defines uh, reinforcement learning, this type of reinforcement learning, as how computational agents take actions in an environment so as to maximize some cumulative reward. So this is a little bit different than some of the things that people do in behavioral psychology. Uh, they have, you know, you have to set up like a reward system and you have to set up, um, you know, how you're going to present that reward over time and how it optimizes learning by the algorithm. So this is the basic setup of a reinforcement learning algorithm. So you have an agent up here, and it takes an action, A sub T, and it goes, it interacts with its environment. So the agent is embedded in an environment, and they take an action in that environment. And then they, they display a behavioral state. So you do something, you display a behavioral state, which is S sub T. And then there's also a reward, R sub T. So every state that you, every action you take results in some reward. And that reward action coupling is a state. And so to change the state, you would take maybe a different action. But to take a different action, you need a reward structure that enables you to do that. So reward is sort of like a feedback for previous interactions. So your state is your current state. And your action then is dependent on the reward that you get for that next action. So if you're doing X, um, and then you have a bunch of rewards that, you know, a reward structure that you kind of learn through doing these different actions. Your state might move from X to Y because your actions change based on the reward. And so this is a, this is definitely a 
sort of a feedback system where you have you have a current state you have a current action, you get rewarded, and then maybe you move to a, a new state based on that reward structure. Um, it, that's all pretty abstract, but we'll kind of maybe show a little bit more about how that works in practice later. Um, this means that you have something called a policy, which maps the age between the agent state and the action. So, for example, there's a a you design a policy to say, okay, there's this a there's this desirable state that we want, and the agents all start in some initial state which isn't really biased towards anything. We want to give them a range of actions that they can take, but also rewards that will guide them to the right or desired state. And so the value then is the future reward for potential actions. And if you want to think about this in terms of game theory. The policy is sort of a strategy that you might take. Um, and then the value is sort of a strategy payoff, which is how much reward do you get for taking that strategy or in enabling that strategy. So uh, I want to, but I want to talk first about where reinforcement learning fits into the machine learning pantheon. And as it turns out, we're familiar maybe with supervised and unsupervised techniques. So we know that supervised techniques involve some sort of, uh, you know, labeling or uh, some sort of knowledge of what something is before you plug it into the algorithm. So, you know, if we label our data with colors or letters, we have some idea of where they maybe uh, belong, you know, uh, some attribute about them that might be useful in classifying things. Um, so there's supervised learning. Then there's unsupervised learning, which is just where you present the algorithm with data blindly, with no identifiers or anything, and ex you know expect the algorithm to sort it out and put it into categories. So that would be like um, a cluster analysis, where you're just saying uh, just produce some clusters and see if they're you know accurate or not. Whereas in supervised in the supervised case, you might create categories and say put these in the right category and then check later to see if that happens. Reinforcement learning is sort of its own beast. And reinforcement learning involves learning from mistakes. And so, you know, to get a correct classification of reinforcement learning, you have to train the algorithm on a bunch of mistakes and then it learns from those mistakes and hits the right classification target. So this is an article that I took this image from Reinforcement Learning 101, and this is from Towards Data Science. And they have more information about it in that blog post. And I'll make these slides available online, as always, to so you can get the links. Uh, that there are different varieties of reinforcement learning as well. So we have classical reinforcement learning, which is where we just have the reward state action structure, and there's maybe interaction between you and the computer. Um, then there's deep reinforcement learning, which is where the agent, instead of being maybe a, uh, like an uh, avatar driven by a person, it's a deep neural network or something like that. So in deep RL, they're using a deep neural network as the agent, and they're training the agent on something. This deep neural network is embedded in an environment. And there's, of course, this reward and uh in case this case, observations where the world is observed, there's an action, and then there's a reward. And so you can use deep learning. You can also use something called model-free uh, RL, which involves Q-learning, which is an algorithm not, I'm not going to get into today. But this is a way that they use, uh, you know, different update strategies for the, for the optimization process. So Q-learning is basically that same structure of you know iterative learning but you're uh you have a certain set of weights that you're using to weight evidence that are you know occur closer in time or farther away in time it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh imply any sort of uh, a priori model but it's something that you can do sort of dynamically and and apply the q learning algorithm to the data that way so one example of reinforcement learning, which is exciting, is where they're using it to look at video games. Um, let me 
hide this. Uh, so there are a couple of examples I, I put in this talk. Uh, the first one is this paper playing Atari with deep reinforcement learning. So this is an example of where they've taken some of the old Atari games. And uh, they use these games, of course, because their complexity is fairly low in terms of the graphics and the number of moves you can make. But they're still challenging to the algorithm. So in this case, you have this... Uh, I can't remember what this name of this game is. It's some game where you're moving, oh, Sequest, uh, where you're moving a submarine around and you're trying to avoid being shot at by other submarines. And, you know, there's a, anyway, there's a reward structure of this game to maximize your point total. And you have, uh, basically, this algorithm has been applied to this game. Now, normally humans play this game. And you know they're evading tar they're evading obstacles and making their targets and trying to maximize their score. Well, the algorithm does the same thing, and so they've they actually in this paper they tested the algorithm on both Sequest and another game called Breakout. And I think I have a screenshot of Breakout later in the talk. But basically, Breakout is also a game of this complexity where you're bouncing. A ball off a paddle and you're trying to remove bricks from a from a ceiling that opens up when you win the game you know you're trying to break out of this uh cave or whatever that you're in so it's it's pretty simple the number of moves the number of like states that you can be in so that's why they use these games and to show you how this works that we have training epics here so they've trained it over 100 epics and then they measure the average reward per episode so these epics, I, I assume, are uh, gameplays. So they've, you know, they're training it over and over again. They're using the same algorithm, but they're presenting it with the game over and over again. And they keep, the 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 algorithm keeps playing the game, and you can see that the reward, probably measured through like the score or something, it goes up over time. So it goes up between zero and fifty epics. It really starts to maximize its reward. Then at about 50, after about 50 epics, it starts to plateau, and the reward uh, on breakout at least, it there's an asymptote there. It's kind of a logarithmic learning curve. On Sequest, you see, it's actually it's, uh, it goes up to 50 epics where, or maybe 60 epics where it's learning, it's maximizing its reward, maybe 70 epics, and then you start to see some instability in the algorithm where if you keep training it longer and longer it starts exploring new strategies perhaps and it's a little bit more um, uneven on its performance but you can also look at it in terms of q learning so this is the q score which is the value on this q learning algorithm and in this case it's a little bit the results are a little bit stronger where you have the same logarithmic pattern of learning but it doesn't, like, you don't show this sort of uh, variation in terms of the reward structure. So the Q value actually is maximized all the way up to 100 epics, but it's logarithmic. So, you know, you spend probably epic 0 to 50 really training the algorithm. And after 50, it's sort of increasing, but only nominally, as it's really kind of learned how to play this game. So this was a big advance when it was announced in 2013. Uh, this is, I think, using deep, yeah, deep reinforcement learning. So they're using deep learning to do this sort of thing. And this is totally autonomous. The, the algorithm is getting no input from the, from the human. It's just playing this game on its own. Uh, so this isn't, like, unprecedented. Uh, they've been trying to get, out, you know, artificial intelligence to play games for a long time. Uh, in 1997, uh, IBM's Deep Blue beat uh, Gary Kasparov, who was the world's champion at chess at the time. And he got so angry that he uh, decided he was going to create his own type of chess, which was like a hybrid chess, where he used uh, like human experts and algorithms to develop, you know, optimal chess styles. <clears throat> I won't talk too much about that in this talk, but... um. Suffice it to say that this is a classic sort of 
uh, problem that, that people have used to try to benchmark algorithms. And so in this case, they used AlphaGo to play the game Go with uh, who was the world champion at the time of this game. And Go is like chess, but it's sort of a, a, a variant of chess. They play it a lot in China. And the, you know, the algorithm, it's, it's sort of the computational complexity of chess, but it's a little bit different. In, in this case, this group uh, published a paper in Nature where they were able to use a combination of deep neural networks and tree search to beat the world champion at Go. And so this was another landmark, but it just shows you what these algorithms are capable of. And finally, we have uh, this new paper, which is Human Level Performance in 3D Multiplayer Games with Population-Based Reinforcement Learning. So this is reinforcement learning <coughs> using, bless you, but using a number of different strategies using a population of agents and presenting the algorithm with um, different, you know, with, with information from a game. This is a um, I think a first, some sort of first player game. It's much more complex than the Atari games, but they've, you know, they're using these different uh, scene views as as data to plug into the uh, algorithm, and these agents then are trained in a population uh, context, and then this is what they're using to optimize this algorithm. I remember I read this paper very closely, but um, it's really it looks really interesting. Um, if someone wanted to read it and comment on it, that would be great. Um, but anyways, this is an, yet another type of approach to reinforcement learning, and this was published in Science recently. So there are different ways that this is done. Um, so reinforcement learning, if you look at like how it's implemented in machine learning versus like classical conditioning and then even synaptic plasticity, which is in the brain itself, so classical conditioning happens in sort of a behavioral state, but it also involves a number of brain regions. So it involves things like Hebbian learning, and it revol uh, involves neuronal reward systems like the basal ganglia, which is a part of the brain that <clears throat> responds to rewards. And there are a number of different ways that this is a very complicated diagram. I took this from the Scholarpedia site. But it sort of shows like the different things that are involved in, say, like the machine learning implementation of uh, reinforcement learning, sort of the classical conditioning form of it, which is a combination of like, you know, updating behavioral states. But the, of course, the brain is doing a lot of work in that. And then synaptic plasticity, which is really kind of separated from uh, the machine instance because it involves a lot of signaling between different neurochemicals producing states like long-term potentiation and short-term potentiation and things like that. So that's, I mean, that's how it's all related in terms of the biology versus the machine learning. Uh, but of course, we expect uh, reinforcement learning to behave like a human, like a human brain and make decisions like a human. That's the whole, or even like a, uh, some sort of animal. That's the whole logic behind it. And so uh, related issues and topics. So now I want to move on to some little bit harder um, detail on these models. So the first thing I talked about before was the policy gradient. And that's a very, that's sort of like the core of this type of algorithm. So let's walk through it a little bit. I took this from a medium post here. Uh, so you can look that up in more detail if you want, but let's walk through it. So consider what they, something they call an instinct, which is denoted by the symbol pi, and that's described by an action given an initial state. So we have our notation here, an action, of course, is just something that the algorithm does, and that's given an initial state that it starts out at. The objective, then, is to find a policy, which is theta, that creates a trajectory which yields maximally expected rewards. So it this objective here, which is the objective of the instinct, is to create, uh, have an action given an initial state. This creates a trajectory over time. So your policy is a bunch of uh, instincts and a bunch of actions and a bunch of initial states over time. 
So you execute one, you execute another, you get feedback, you execute another, you get feedback, and so on and so forth. And that's your policy. And the policy, of course, there you have expected rewards for a certain policy. So you think, well, what's the probability of this trajectory of behavior? You know, the agent doesn't really make uh, behaviors at random. It could make them at random, but generally they're uh, behaviors that are more likely and less likely. Of course, they're not rewarded in that way, but they're more accessible states and less accessible states. And then depending on the rewards, you might end up finding the more success, uh, successful states. I'm trying to think of a good example from human behavior, but uh, let's say you had a program where there was some behavior that was really hard for people to attain, maybe like stopping smoking, but there isn't, it isn't really easy for someone who's smoking to just stop smoking. So what you do is you reward people. You reward them in number, a number of ways. You, uh, you know, you, you, maybe you disallow some things. So you kind of, uh, have a negative reward for smoking. Maybe you can't smoke indoors or you uh, have a positive reward for smoking like you give the person a, a, a reward if they don't smoke for a week. And you do these sorts of rewards, positive and negative, to kind of shape the, the behavior towards a more desirable state that maybe is less accessible at the beginning, but it, you know, it's, that's what you would use to attain that behavior. Um, so it's, it's a combination of the trajectory of behaviors towards the desired state and the reward structure. Um, the trajectories extend to some time horizon, so we don't want to project it infinitely out into time. We generally think, okay, we want to achieve this behavioral change or this behavioral optimization in a certain time horizon. And you saw with one of the game examples, they measured it for 100 epochs. So that's a finite time horizon. And as you saw, it wasn't really needed. We had about 50 to 70 epochs that really maximized our um, our training on this trajectory. Uh, so the state itself can consist of either specific or generalized features. So in a, a machine learning context, your state can be, you know, it could be like the joint angles on a robot, or depending on how the algorithm is uh, implemented, it could be whole images with features in it. So you might want to train your model to correctly identify features in a biological image. Um, you know, maybe cells. Now, the machine has no understanding of what cells are initially, but you would train the machine. To, okay, you if it picks something that's ovoid or circular, then that's a reward for the algorithm. If it picks something that's blobby, maybe it depends on the cell type, that might be rewarded or with a negative um, reward as well. And so there are ways you can optimize this so that the reward structure really kind of narrows down, narrow, you know, and it drills down to the features that you want and their properties. Um, and the policy objective then can be either stochastic or a series of directed actions. Like I said, you can start off with uh, a stochastic action, like just picking an action out of a hat, or you can direct the algorithm to certain actions, a certain subset of actions, and train it that way. Really depends on how the algorithm is implemented. And that also determines the effectiveness of the policy. Uh, another important uh, concept is temporal difference learning. So this is related to policies. Um, and this is taken from the Scholarpedia page that I told you about earlier. Um, so a given sequence of behavioral states and rewards, this uh, is uh, this is the signal, this is the reward. So this is the thing that you're, the state actually. Um, and then this is the reward. And you keep doing this iteratively. So you have a state, you have a reward. You have a state, you have a reward. This state might change as you get rewarded positively or negatively. And you end up in a final state where you have you know, a bunch of rewards that have shaped you to that point. So all the, the sequence of behavioral states and rewards produces an action policy. And this is termed the state function. And this is an expected return of strategy. So uh, your strategy should have some sort of return to it. And of course, the return should be optimal. But not all policies are optimal. Some policies are, 
you know, pretty bad. Uh, because you use the policy based on, like, you know, you might actually get the policy from, like, observing the data set and figuring out maybe what so certain rules are. You know, you might see a, a un unsupervised or unlabeled data set and try to maybe extract some uh, statistical features from it and use those statistical features to shape the uh, reward structure of your policy. But you might have a number of competing policies where you don't really know what the actual payoff is. You think they're all optimal, but maybe some aren't. So you want to try different act policies and you want to evaluate them. So temporal difference learning allows you to do this, where you have this iterative, uh, you know, you have the state and you have the reward and you have this sort of structure that's an, a time dependent. And then you have this parameter, which is a discount factor. And the discounts uh, are negative weights. And this, you know, you can negatively weight things that are farther into the future. So you can have some sort of open loop control where, you know, you reward things early on and then their reward becomes less salient as you go move on as this desired, as you approach the desired state. So this is to sort of avoid overfitting where you don't want to over reward the algorithm for seeking out maybe new states or maybe you know, you, you want to, you have a target state that you want to achieve, but you reward it too much. And so it starts to explore different states again. I mean, there, there are different ways this can play out. Um, you could do this through open loop control, which is using this uh, sort of weight scheme. And then you can also have a sort of what they call the neuronal version, which is how it sort of happens in the brain. But you can actually apply this to machines as well where you have a neuron called V, and that can predict a reward R. And this updates adaptively until the algorithm or the behavior converges. So this is a closed loop system. So in this case, you would have like a, a unit neuron V, which would predict some reward. And then you update whether it's actually correctly predicted it or not until you get some sort of answer that's convergent. And um, so there are different ways to do temporal difference learning. But the idea is that you're looking at the difference in time over, you know, your states. And you're looking at the rewards in time. And you're evaluating this whole structure so that it's, you know, you can achieve your optimal state. And then finally, I'm going to talk about something that you might find in the literature called the exploration exploitation trade-off. So this is kind of related to what I was talking about with overfitting of your model, um, or underfitting for that matter. Um, so you have this idea that the algorithm can exploit different areas of the of the state space. Like, you know, if you want to like change behavior, uh, you have to have a state space where you have different behavioral states that are possible. But you don't want to explore every state. You want to be able to find an optimal state. But you also want to explore enough states so that you find the optimal state that you, you desire. So on the left, um, this is an example of this trade-off uh, in terms of the amount of information versus the return. And so in this case, it's finding, figuring out if the sky is blue or not by asking people. So uh, let's suppose you don't like you're blind or you have a blindfold on, you don't know the sky is blue. So you start asking people whether the sky is blue. So if you ask one person, which is a very small amount of information, that the sky is blue and they say yes, that's a pretty high return on your investment. Um, but you, of course, you don't know if they're lying to you or if they're like, no, if they can't see either. So you might ask 10 people whether the sky is blue. Now, there's less information in asking 10 people but the return is also a little bit less as well, because you ask 10 people, you'll get a lot of redundancy. But on the other hand, you'll get an average, and you can tell that way. Um, if 50 people tell you the sky is blue, that reduces your amount of information. It also reduces your return on investment, since you're asking more people. And then 2,000 people have told you the sky is blue. Your amount of information is very low relative to your return. And that's that's assuming that you know like the amount of people lying to you or don't truly know is very low, and so that's the idea behind this. You don't need to explore everything, um, 
but you do need to have some information and the amount of information decreases as you explore so another way to think of this is the one arm or the unarmed bandit problem so the unarmed bandit problem and you'll find this not just in in reinforcement learning but in other areas like uh, genetic algorithms and the idea is that you have um like is called the one-armed bandit originally because I was based on a slot machine, which is right here. And the idea is that, you know, you pull the lever and, you know, you lose your quarter or your, how much ever money you put into it because a slot machine is basically, you know, just playing a game against nature. You know, you're playing, <laughs> you know, your odds of winning are very low by uh, pulling, pulling the lever, but, you know, you keep playing, you might win. And it's, you know, it's it's the classic gambling problem. So the idea is that, you know, you're playing this game against nature and you're trying to get a, or some sort of payoff from that. But the idea is that if you, so you, you play one slot machine and that's exploration. You're exploring that state space, seeing if you can get to a certain state. And since you're doing it randomly, it will take a long time to get there. But if you add a bunch of machines in parallel, which is the NRM bandit, you can keep exploring by pulling a bunch of levers at the same time. And I think if you've ever visited a casino, you'll see this where there will be people with a bucket of quarters and they'll, like, you know, pull a bunch of, you know, have a bunch of uh, uh, slot machines in a row that they're playing all at the same time. And they're trying to win by distributing their chances. Of course, you know, it doesn't necessarily work that way. But in this case, it would allow you to explore a vast space in a very short amount of time. But there is a this trade-off exists. So you can use as many bandits as you want. But, you know, just because you're playing an infinite number of bandits doesn't mean you have a better chance of getting to that point. So this is a, a something you should be aware of, the center of a bandit problem. Uh, and then finally, you have multi-level optimization, which is where you have, you can use, you can break the problem up into different levels where you have different agents in that, in those levels exploiting and exploring things differentially. So you can break the problem up into modules and you can explore the problem that way using your uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. And each of these agents would be a single agent in a, in a reinforcement learning context. Each of these agents would have, you know, the ability to learn from rewards and then eventually get to the answer. And so those are all the slides I have. Uh, there is a, for those of you who are interested in genetic algorithms, there is a link, of course, between this and genetic algorithms. I, kind of highlighted it in the last slide, but um, there's definitely like a lot of commonalities, both in terms of using a biological process to to uh, look at data and look at problems related to search and sort of the um, some of the, the concepts that are used. So let's see what our chat window looks like here. So uh, let's see, where are we here? Okay, please hit hide button. I did that. Uh, Richard asked, did they give curves for a naive human player for comparison? I don't remember that they did. Uh, you mean with the playing Go and playing the other games? Uh, well, they didn't really, I didn't, I don't know if they've measured that too much. I know that they, uh, that I, I know from like some of the literature on training in like, in the psychological literature, that there are curves for human learning in, in games and in expertise. So you see that same pattern uh, where you have this initial burst of learning where you're learning the parameters of the game, and then there's a plateau where you're kind of learning the particulars of the game, but you've already kind of mastered the, the basic aspect of it. So that pattern, that sort of logarithmic pattern of learning is the same between humans and machines, but I don't know how they match up exactly. Um, and then Richard also asked a question about uh, an application is the use of use of X-ray photons in computed tomography. Can they cause cancer? So how can we keep the number of photons used to a minimum? So that yeah, that that would be I think a good application. I don't know if people have done that. I mean, it sounds like they may have. Uh, people like to explore. Um, 
these type of problems? Not really. Uh, the uh, it's the image quality goes down as the number of photons goes down. Okay. So the the question is, what is the minimum number of photons you need to achieve sufficient image quality to do a diagnosis? Okay. 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 And uh, so there are a number of parameters there, but no one's looked at that question seriously. Huh. As far as I know. Yeah. Uh, especially because most of the algorithms are not photon count based. So you have to change the computer tomography algorithm so they do the best possible with a small number of photons rather than such a large number that you can use the law of large numbers. Yeah. Okay. 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 So I think it's a good area of research. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, this, we'll just, <laughs> I'll think about that. Um, <laughs> so, anyone else have any comments, questions? Yeah, let, let me make just one point about that computer tomography. Computer tomography now uh, uh, produces the lion's share, the, the greatest majority of the amount of dose that people get from medical x rays. Really? So it's, yes, so it's actually a serious problem. And uh, there have been many papers, at least on regard to children, that uh, doing computer tomography of children uh, can cause more cancer than it finds. Yeah. So it's, it's serious for children and it's probably problematic for adults. Right. Okay. Well, if anyone's interested in that further, you can ask Dick uh, if, if you know he can if you want to follow up on that. I, I'll think about it some more. Um, anyone else have any comments? Uh, okay, Benet, no questions. I think this talk gave a very nice overview of reinforcement learning. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a. Uh, uh, definitely an interesting technique. Uh, I wanted to cover it because it's, um, you know, it's, it's in that, like we talk about machine learning a lot, but it's like, you know, there are different sort of versions of it. Um, and like, you know, it's, it's actually become pretty popular, especially for like applying it to games. But also there are probably a lot of other uh, techniques that can be, you know, can, or things that can be applied to uh, deep Reinforcement learning, you'll see it's very hot in the literature right now. Uh, like uh, a number of the open, a like groups like OpenAI and When Do I Sleep? Well, I just put that together. I was doing some reading on it. So <laughs> actually, I've become pretty adept at putting together talks so, or slideshows like this. So, so yeah. Um, so, okay. Well, I guess we're at near the top of the hour. Okay. Let's see. Ojawa has a cup and Jesse. Uh, one of, all right. So Ojawa says, one of the applications of reinforcement learning is in self-driving cars. We're using the same techniques in our project as well. Yes. I am part of a team which is working on the self-driving car project. Okay. That's nice. Uh, so this is at your university. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's at uh, IIT Delhi. Is that correct? Um, and they're working on the self-driving car project. And uh, self-driving cars are interesting because they uh, they can figure out some of the aspects of self-driving cars, but like they still can't figure out whether there are people in the crosswalk at certain times. So, so that's I mean that's interesting. Hope you guys find some success. And then Jesse says, uh, I have things, but I'll say on Slack, harder to say here, interest in influences of trajectories and have structures that support capacities for development. Good talk. Thanks. Yeah. So like I said, there's a lot of, there are a lot of connections to like things like feedback and genetic algorithms and other things that aren't immediately apparent in reinforcement learning. But yeah, we can talk about those as well. So um, yeah. Yeah, well, thanks. Okay, well, uh, we're at the top of the hour, 
And so, uh, when we, okay, what about an algorithm for avoiding self-driving cars? Oh yeah, you dropped out when we were talking about that. So I said that uh, they've made some pretty good advances in self-driving cars, but sometimes the uh, self-driving cars can't um, <laughs> identify whether there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk. So there is a there is a problem with that, and uh, it's something that needs to be solved, obviously, before we can really put self-driving cars on the road in large numbers. So it's, you know, they have them apparently in San Francisco. They have a lot of self-driving cars, and you get reports of people getting, like, uh, you know, in accidents or things like that. Uh, you know, it's a problem, uh, but it's something, of course, that needs to be solved before widespread adoption. So, all right. So, uh, uh, well, thanks for attending, everyone. And if you need to contact me over the course of the week, uh, send me a Slack message or email. And next week, we'll try to move the meeting to Monday morning instead of Wednesday morning. And I'll send an email out about that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a good week. Okay. See you later.